Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast. Using radiotherapy tumor reactive monoclonal antibodies and IL-2 to engage innate and adaptive anti-tumor immunity. Presented by Dr. Paul Sondo, Professor of Pediatrics, Department of Human Oncology and Genetics, University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Xavier Gutierrez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sando. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Hello, I'm Paul Sondell. Thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to be focusing on how we can be combining various forms of therapy to engage both the innate and adaptive immune systems to have a beneficial anti-tumor effect. I work here at the University of Wisconsin as shown here. I'm involved in a variety of collaborations, but none of these involve any financial conflict of interest. This is a schema of where cancer immunotherapy currently is in 2018. A number of different cell types are involved and the major focus of the cancer immunotherapy clinical application is focused on the adaptive component of the immune system, namely turning on T cells ability to recognize tumor peptides presented by the MHC molecule on tumor cells in order to destroy them. And this approach has had uh, quite a bit of success in select kinds of cancers. Uh, in addition, there is a separate kind of immunotherapy that is also having quite a bit of success. This is the synthetic recognition that can be allowed by utilizing not the immune system's own endogenous recognition capability, but rather passively applied synthetically created molecules like monoclonal antibodies made in the laboratory to help direct endogenous immune cells like natural killer cells or to modify immune cells like T cells and turn them into chimeric antigen receptor T cells. Uh, these approaches have met with a fair amount of success recently, particularly in tumors that are difficult for the adaptive immune system to recognize uh, specifically, there's been great progress in pediatric leukemia and certain solid tumors. We think that the future and what we'll be talking about today is how to tie together these two kinds of recognition, both synthetic and adaptive, in order to try and maximize the ability of the immune system to recognize and destroy cancer for a therapeutic benefit. A disease model that I'll be speaking about to some component in this talk is that of pediatric neuroblastoma. The concepts presented in this talk, however, don't apply only to pediatric disease or only to neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma is the most common solid tumor in children that occurs outside of the brain. This graph shows that roughly half of children with neuroblastoma at the time of diagnosis have high risk disease. And up until nine years ago, the prognosis of these children using very aggressive combination modality therapy was still on the order of only 30%. And so our team and many others were focused on how might we use the immune system to help the prognosis of those children. Dr. Jackie Hank in our laboratory began testing a monoclonal antibody 
that we received from Ralph Reisfeld, shown here. This antibody, now called dinatuximab, is a monoclonal antibody that recognizes the dicyalogangliocide, GD2, that is overexpressed on neuroblastoma, on melanoma, on certain other pediatric solid cancers, and certain other adult sarcomas and lung cancer. Our focus was neuroblastoma. And what Dr. Hank showed in the laboratory is if she coats neuroblastoma cells with this antibody, the antibody by itself doesn't kill the neuroblastoma at all. But if she activates human natural killer cells with a potent immune activator, interleukin-2, which itself was approved in 1998 as an immunotherapy for melanoma and renal cell cancer, it caused dramatic activation of human natural killer cells, and those natural killer cells were able to kill the antibody-coated tumor cells. So there was a clear synergy. The graph at the top shows that we could make this work with blood from healthy donors. But if we took blood from patients with cancer and tested them, they didn't work in this in vitro system very well. But if we took those same patients with cancer and gave them in vivo interleukin-2, it activated their natural killer cells so that now they could kill neuroblastoma cells in the setting of this monoclonal antibody and IL-2. We then took that concept and asked, could we move this first through in vitro testing, then through mouse testing, and then into initial phase one level clinical trials? And with help from several collaborators, uh, we were able to test this concept in adults with melanoma here at the UW Cancer Center and in children with neuroblastoma through our work in the children's oncology group. In brief, we tested patients by giving them interleukin-2 together with anti-GD2 monoclonal antibody to try and simulate what we had shown in vitro we learned a lot about pharmacokinetics and uh, pharmacodynamics, but sadly, very few patients were showing clinical benefit. We went back to the drawing board and determined that when this approach was used in mice, it had the most potent effects if we were treating mice that had only minimal amounts of cancer in them, enough cancer that without treatment, these mice would all die. Based on that, we felt that this approach might be best treating patients who were in remission, but at high risk for relapse. Secondly, if activating natural killer cells with IL-2 to induce antibody-dependent cell killing by the monoclonal antibody, we thought getting other cells involved that could mediate that same process through their FC receptors, cells like macrophages and neutrophils would make sense, and preclinical work being done by Nai Kong Chung at Sloan Kettering and Alice Yu at the UCSD were showing the GMCSF, uh, an activator of those neutrophils and macrophages, could induce ADCC uh, using the same antibody. So the Children's Oncology group, group initiated a clinical trial randomizing patients that were in remission after combined chemotherapy, surgery, radiation therapy, and autologous transplant to put these neuroblastoma patients into remission. And once they were in remission, they were randomized to receive this complex immunotherapy regimen, IL-2, GMCSF, and anti-GD2 antibody. The study began in 2003, and in 2009, our statisticians called us and said we needed to stop the study because the study had passed the statistical threshold for study cessation. The data shown here show that at that time, uh, with only about 60% of the patients entered into the study that we thought would be needed, we had passed the threshold with a p-value of 0.012, showing that the patients receiving the immunotherapy had a dramatically improved event-free survival compared to those that were not getting the immunotherapy. Uh, based on that, this work was published in 2010 in the New England Journal, and five years later, in 2015, this regimen and this anti-GD2 antibody, now renamed dinatuximab, was approved by the FDA as the treatment of choice 
for children with high-risk neuroblastoma that achieve remission, and this same regimen was approved the subsequent year as the treatment of choice for patients in Europe. So this was clearly a step in the right direction uh, and is now the standard of care. But even with that improvement, you can see that we need to do much better because too many children that are getting this regimen are still dying. Uh, so we know that this uh, anti-tumor approach is working through both uh, the GMCSF and IL-2 and the antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. And that ADCC effect is mediated largely by natural killer cells. So one of the things we wanted to ask is, might we be able to use some precision medicine approach to understand which cells are involved and which patients might be more likely to benefit from this immunotherapy than others? So natural killer cells are regulated in their response by so-called killer immunoglobulin-like receptors, KIR molecules. I'm oversimplifying here, but these KIR molecules are largely inhibitory molecules, and the ligands that they see are the HLA molecules on normal tissues or on tumor cells. And when these KIR receptors see those HLA molecules, uh, the natural killer cells are turned off. What's shown in this slide is that roughly 40% of the human population inherits their KIR genes, which are controlled by the 19th human chromosome, uh, in such a way that they have KIR receptors that are matched for all of their HLA molecules, which are controlled by the 6th chromosome. Uh, these people are so-called KIR-matched or self-matched patients. The remaining 60% of the population have inherited a KIR repertoire such that they have at least one inhibitory KIR gene that does not see a corresponding ligand, a corresponding HLA molecule, and that's what's shown at the bottom. These people are so-called KIR self-mismatch, and these people have somewhat more potent NK cells because at least some of their NK cells are not being inhibited by the HLA. So past studies have shown that patients that are uh, this cure uh, self-mismatched have slightly better uh, function in the setting of allogeneic bone marrow transplant. And we asked whether there might be some possible connection of them in the setting of uh, cure uh, interactions with the immunotherapy that I just showed you. So on the next slide, doctors Amy Irby Gurel and Wei Wang looked at this cure matched versus cure mismatched issue for patients that were in this large clinical trial that I showed you that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And we did the cure cure ligand genotyping of all of these patients to ask might these genes in any way influence the response to the immunotherapy? Here are the data that uh, we obtained. This is a somewhat complex slide uh, that I'll simplify in the next two slides. But what we're looking at here is the overall survival of the patients in that randomized trial. The patients that were randomized to receive immunotherapy are shown with the black lines. The patients that did not receive the immunotherapy are shown with the red lines. The patients that have the cure ligand missing genotype are the dashed lines. And the patients that have the cure ligands present are shown in the solid lines. And it's a little easier if you look at this in the next slide. So here we're just showing those patients that did or didn't get immunotherapy and had the cure ligands missing. And uh, you can see that uh, these patients, uh, uh, 118 out of 174 patients, so about 65% uh, or so of our patient population have this genotype. And it looks like for them, the immunotherapy didn't seem to make a difference. In contrast, the next group, we're looking at uh, roughly 35% of our patients. These are the ones that have uh, the uh, cure ligands present. And for them, it looks like the immunotherapy is making a very major difference for them. Now this work 
has only been looked at in this way, in this one randomized trial. We're in the process of collecting patient samples from additional neuroblastoma patients to compare those that got immunotherapy and those that didn't to see if this is validated. But this would be an example of where one could use this potential genotyping information to potentially determine which patients might best benefit from this form of immunotherapy, and for those that might not benefit from this form, to be using some other or expanded kind of therapy to try and help their overall survival. So that's a hypothesis that's yet to be tested. But overall, when we look at the data from that randomized trial, we see there are two areas that we're, we really need to improve on. The first, shown by the blue arrow, is for those patients that were randomized when they were in remission to receive the immunotherapy and got the immunotherapy, shown by the black line. And even amongst those patients, roughly 45 to 50 percent are still relapsing of their neuroblastoma. It means we need to do better, even though this immunotherapy regimen is helping. But separately, and more difficult to see, is in order to get this immunotherapy, those patients needed to enter remission following their initial induction chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and autologous bone marrow transplant. And as you can see from the green arrow, about 30% of newly diagnosed high-risk neuroblastoma patients don't enter remission and therefore didn't even receive this kind of immunotherapy because our preclinical data say that it wouldn't be of help to them. So there are a number of approaches listed in the bottom left that are being used to try and make an impact on uh, those two areas. Uh, one is combining this kind of immunotherapy with chemotherapy. Another is generating chimeric antigen receptor T cells that are reacting to GD2. The third is to genetically engineer the monoclonal antibody so it can work better. And the last is to deliver a local immunotherapy to turn on both an innate and an adaptive immune response. In this talk, I'm gonna focus on those last two issues. Now this is important because the likelihood of the most common form of immunotherapy that is being used clinically, namely immune checkpoint inhibition, such as uh, CTLA-4 blockade or PD-1 blockade, seems to be effective only for those patients that have so-called hot tumors, tumors that have a high uh, tumor mutation burden and therefore have a high level of neoantigens with a high level of infiltrating T cells. In other, an immune, in other words, an immune response that's already been turned on. But most pediatric cancers, as shown on the left, and the vast majority of adult cancers, shown in the middle along the x-axis, have relatively low tumor mutation burdens and are therefore cold cancers, not showing great responses to immune checkpoint blockade. So the concept be behind immune checkpoint blockade is if you've got lots of neoantigens and if you've got T cells that are trying to respond but just not effective because the brakes have been turned on, if you take the brakes off, it'll help the endogenous immune system respond. But if your car is parked on the level and isn't trying to move forward, just taking the brakes off isn't going to help unless you can turn the engine on. So we'd like to get the engine turned on by getting the immune system interested in the tumor in order to try and help checkpoint blockade work better. So the next example I'd like to give is genetically engineered monoclonal antibodies to try and have a more potent effect. So what's shown at the upper right of this slide is an anti-GD2 antibody, like the ones that are being used clinically. It's a humanized antibody, but most importantly, at the lower right of that antibody, what's schematized is those blue ovals. That's IL-2. It's been directly uh, genetically fused as a fusion, pr fusion protein to this, this monoclonal antibody. So this antibody will bind to the GD2 on tumors that express GD2, but it'll bring IL-2 to the tumor microenvironment. This immunocytokine uh, was created by Ralph Reisfeld and Steve Gillies, and at the lower left, you can see that mice with metastatic neuroblastoma uh, show huge numbers of liver metastases if they get PBS as their treatment. 
if they get treated with the combination of anti-GD2 antibody and IL-2 injected in the same syringe as separate molecules, the number and size of metastases is much smaller, but there's still metastases there. Well, if you give the same molar amounts of that same antibody and IL-2, but now is this fusion protein, this immunocytokine, you don't see cancer. At the lower right, Zane Neal in our laboratory tested this concept in mice that had metastatic neuroblastoma and showed that the potency of this immunocytokine depends on how much neuroblastoma is there at the time you start using this treatment. If you start this treatment, uh, 11 days or nine days after you implant the neuroblastoma, you still have some improvement in metastases, but not enough. While if you start on day five or earlier, you really eradicate the metastases. So uh, at the upper left, you can see in point four, this approach seems to work as single agent therapy and minimal residual disease in mice. We did a phase two trial of this same approach in children with neuroblastoma through the Children's Oncology Group. Uh, that trial was published in 2010, and a repeat trial of the same concept uh, was published uh, in, uh, at the ASCO meeting in 2015, both of them showing that this fusion protein works for advanced neuroblastoma, but it works best in patients with less bulky disease. So based on that, we're moving this concept forward. But as much as that might work for minimal residual disease, we'd like to try and have an immunotherapy that can work against measurable disease because far too many patients aren't entering remission with their upfront therapy or are relapsing with measurable disease before their current therapy is effective. So Eric Johnson and Sasha Rekmelovich in our lab took a GD2-positive melanoma, implanted it in the flank of a mouse, let it grow to the point where it was barely palpable. So it's no longer minimal disease, but it's barely big enough to feel. And they were able to show that if you treat those mice with intravenous immunocytokine, as shown in the middle line in this graph, it dramatically slows the growth of the tumor, but the tumors are still growing. But if you put that same amount of immunocytokine directly into the tumor, labeled by ITIC, intratumoral immunocytokine. Now, many of the mice were tumor-free, and the tumors that were still there were growing much more slowly. So uh, Eric was able to show that this was no longer just an innate immune response, but under this circumstance, both innate cells and T cells, the adaptive immune response was involved. Richard Yang was able to look at this same phenomenon in a neuroblastoma model, and showed when the immunocytokine was injected intratumorally, he could show curative responses in mice and show that both natural killer cells and T cells were involved in this response. He could show this also in this graph where he took mice with a palpable neuroblastoma, injected those mice with the intratumoral immunocytokine and showed that roughly 60% of those mice were cured of a palpable a neuroblastoma. But if he depleted either the T cells, shown by the black squares, or depleted NK cells, shown by the black triangles, he lost this effect. So this is a clear example of where both innate immune recognition and adaptive immune recognition, both NK cells and T cells, have to be working together in order to get this curative response. But here again, these tumors are quite small. Uh, so since we know T cells can be involved, can we enhance this response with checkpoint blockade that helps activate T cells uh, to function better if they're initially turned on? So Sasha Rekmelovich took this melanoma model, that's a GD2 mouse melanoma, put it in mice, and let it grow for seven days to the point where it's barely measurable. So it's small, but it's still macroscopic. What's shown on the left is that animals that are getting treated with checkpoint blockade, the red line, show no improvement at all. So even though this immunocy immunocytokine can have an effect, in the absence of immunocytokine, the checkpoint blockade isn't working, so this is a cold tumor. The green line shows how the immunocytokine by itself is dramatically slowing the growth of these tumors.
but these tumors are still growing. When both are combined, the immunocytokine and the uh, anti-CTLA-4 checkpoint blockade, the yellow line shows that there's dramatic slowing of the growth of these tumors as shown on the survival curve at the right. So from the perspective of a mouse study, this is dramatic success. But from the perspective of clinical immunotherapy, this is not successful enough because most of these animals are still dying. And if you do this exact same approach in a tumor that was growing for only 12 days instead of seven days, like in the last slide, you can see in, in this picture, the control untreated tumors are the black line, the tumors that are getting treated with both the immunocytokine and the checkpoint blockade are the blue line. While they're growing slower, all of these animals have tumors that are growing. If this were a clinical phase two trial where there wasn't a randomized control group, it would be a failed trial because all of these uh, subjects in this trial would be progressing. So clearly we need to do better and we need to do better with bigger tumors. So at this point, fortunately enter into the scene is my colleague, Zach Morris, an MD PhD who is a radiation oncologist who worked in our laboratory on this concept uh, during his residency and uh, two years ago finished his residency and began his own laboratory in the uh, cancer center here on the floor below. We're still collaborating closely. What Zach did was take these exact same melanoma cells injected them into these immunocompetent mice. And instead of letting them grow for seven days or 12 days, they grew for five full weeks. So these are now large macroscopic tumors, uh, 200 cubic millimeters in size. He took them and he treated with a low dose of radiation therapy, a dose that wouldn't shrink these tumors, that would only slow their growth to some degree. And then five days later, he injected these tumors with the antibody IL-2 immunocytokine and looked at how this combination would work. And the data are shown on this next slide. At the upper left are the size of the tumors. The gold line shows how these large tumors continue to grow if they get no treatment. The green line shows how this dose of radiation therapy, 12 gray, about uh, one third to one fourth the dose that's used for palliative purposes in the setting of melanoma. Slows these tumors, but doesn't shrink them. The black line shows how the intratumoral immunocytokine slows these tumors, but doesn't shrink them. And the purple line shows really to our surprise. For the first time, we've got these large tumors in these mice that are now shrinking away. And 73% of these mice became tumor free without any tumor at all, not only after 60 days, but for many months after that. And these mice had a long lasting memory. In order to show that, what Zach did was take these mice that were cured by getting their radiation therapy at five weeks and their immunotherapy five days later. And if they had no evidence of tumor at, uh, 10 weeks after that point, they would then get injected with another dose of that same melanoma, and they would reject it as shown at the top. And those mice that rejected that same melanoma could then be injected with a separate immunologically related melanoma, the B16 tumor, or an unrelated pancreatic tumor. These mice would reject the B16 tumor because of the shared antigens between B16 and B78, but they would not reject the pancreatic cancer we published many mechanistic studies regarding what's involved in this immune response. And the bottom line importance is that we've got both the need for the innate immune recognition and the adaptive immune recognition to get rid of these really large sizable tumors. As much as we were excited about those results, we didn't think that was good enough to really be moving forward clinically. Because the real problem with clinical cancer is not only the cancer you can see, but it's distant cancer at other sites that you might or might not be able to see. So radiation oncologists have long described this so-called abscopal effect, where very rare individuals might get radiation at a single site of cancer. And after that radiation, as expected, if enough radiation was given, that cancer would shrink. But distant sites would normally continue to grow. But in rare patients with cancer, after you irradiate a single site, distant sites would shrink. 
So the applicable effect means getting an immune effect at a distant site. So in this setting, we've got uh, these patients uh, having distant cancer shrink, and it was long thought to potentially be mediated by an immunologic mechanism. So Zach Morris in our lab asked, might this process be something we could try and simulate in the mouse model and get intentional control of this to try and make this happen in an intentional and clinically controllable way. So Zach set up a model to try and do this. At the bottom left, you can see, as before, he would put this melanoma into these mice, let it grow for five full weeks before it would be large enough to be treated with the radiation therapy. But before that tumor was big enough to get treated with radiation therapy, he would implant the same melanoma on the other flank. That tumor would be shielded by the radiation therapy because it would reflect a small incipient cancer that we might not be clinically aware of and therefore not know to irradiate. And so at the time of radiation, the large tumor is irradiated, the smaller tumor is not irradiated. And five days later, the large tumor gets the injection of the immunotherapy. We thought we knew what was gonna happen. We thought that the radiation to the large tumor and the immunotherapy given to the large tumor would turn on the potent immune response that I've shown before, would make that tumor shrink, would turn on systemic adaptive immunity that would be able to go throughout the mouse and kill smaller tumors wherever they were. Just like I showed you that systemic immune response could protect a mouse from rechallenge of that same tumor. Well, that's what we expected. But when we did the experiment, it didn't work that way. And I wanna take a little more time to show you the data here because we were surprised by this. It was initially quite confusing, but we think it's a major key to how we wanna move forward to make this approach successful clinically. So what we're showing here in the upper left are the actual data. The solid purple line shows how if we had only a single tumor in the mouse and we irradiated that single tumor and injected it with the immunotherapy, how that tumor goes away in a mouse treated that way. The dashed line shows what happens to that exact same tumor that gets the irradiation and gets treated with the immunotherapy if that same mouse has a small untreated tumor in the distant flank that was shielded by irradiation. So let me say that again. The presence of the distant tumor that wasn't irradiated and wasn't treated with any immunotherapy not only doesn't shrink, but it's blocking the immunotherapeutic effect at the site of the tumor that gets the radiation and gets the immunotherapy. We find this very frightening because it says if this kind of phenomenon is reproduced in other tumors or is uh, important in clinical cancer, the distant tumors that we might not even know about can block this potent immunologic effect. And we think that this is a tolerance effect. To understand it better, we asked what the specificity of this is. So we set up this same model where we tested a mouse that had a big melanoma that got irradiated and got immunotherapy, but we made the small tumor on the other side that was shielded from the radiation, the pancreatic cancer, PANCO2. And what you can see, the data are shown at the bottom. The solid purple line shows how a mouse with only one tumor, that's the melanoma, has that tumor respond if it's treated with radiation and immunotherapy. The dashed purple line shows what I showed in the previous experiment. Namely, if that same mouse has two melanomas, one that's irradiated and injected with immunotherapy, and one that's shielded from radiation, the treated tumor doesn't respond. The yellow line shows this is a specific kind of tolerance. What this says is if the large tumor that gets irradiation and immunotherapy, if that's melanoma, and the small tumor that's shielded on the other side and doesn't get any immunotherapy, if, that's mel if that one is the pancreatic cancer, the different kind of tumor, then the melanoma that we treat with radiation and immunotherapy still responds. 
In other words, something about that small shielded tumor crosses throughout the mouse. And if the other tumor is the exact same kind as the untreated tumor, it blocks the immune response. Now in data that I don't have time to show, we showed specificity of this because we set up the same exact phenomenon with a mouse that has a large pancreatic tumor. It responds to the melanoma if we have just one pancreatic tumor in the mouse. If the small separate tumor is a pancreatic cancer, the big pancreatic cancer won't respond. But if the small separate tumor is a melanoma, the big pancreatic cancer will respond to immunotherapy. So this is a cancer-specific immune tolerance. It's very frightening to us, and how might we potentially overcome it? Well, one thing we did was set up the same model system with two melanomas, a big one and a small one, irradiate the big one, inject the big one with immunotherapy, but also irradiate the small one. And under these conditions, shown with the dotted purple line, even though the immunotherapy is only going to the big tumor, as long as you irradiate both tumors, now the big tumor responds, as shown by the dotted purple line. And so irradiating that small tumor blocks this concomitant immune tolerance, and that radiation therapy dose is only 12 gray. It's not enough to make that small tumor shrink. So this is a very radiation-sensitive tolerance effect. So the fact that it is so tumor specific and it is also inhibited by radiation says that this immune tolerance is specific and radiation sensitive. One component of the immune response that's very specific and radiation sensitive are T cells. And we know inhibitory T cells, specifically called T regulatory cells, are very potent at suppressing immune responses and under certain conditions, can suppress them in a very antigen-specific way. So what's shown on the left is some proof that that's the mechanism involved. What you can see with this data is animals that have uh, only one tumor and get no radiation to that tumor have a fair number of T regulatory cells in them. That's the gray bar. But if we irradiate that one tumor in these mice and look uh, six days later, the purple bar shows that we've gotten rid of most of those T regulatory cells. But if you look at that same tumor in a mouse that has two tumors and you irradiate that one tumor with the same amount of radiation and look at it six days later, the tan bar shows that even though it was irradiated, you still have as many T regulatory cells as you had before, six days after radiation. And it's because of that distant small tumor that you didn't irradiate. It must be that the T regulatory cells are migrating from that small non-irradiated tumor to this one and playing a role in inhibiting the effect. To prove it, we did the experiment at the right. These are mice that are transgenic for a way to deplete their T regulatory cells. Uh, they have on their T regulatory cells a receptor that responds to the diphtheria toxin. Uh, what we did was set up this two-tumor model, irradiate the large melanoma, inject the large melanoma with the immunotherapy, and if we don't deplete the T regulatory cells, we got the solid purple line. Uh, that treated tumor didn't respond. But if we use the diphtheria toxin to get rid of the T regulatory cells, now that tumor responds as shown by the dotted purple line. And in controls that aren't shown here, if we use diphtheria toxin alone, there's no effect against the tumor. So how might we translate into something that's more clinically relevant? So um, most oncologists are today very familiar with checkpoint blockade. The initial successful molecule was anti-CTLA-4, uh, ipilimumab, and other similar agents. Uh, Alan Corman, who devised and created the clinical form of ipilimumab, is doing a mouse work, and we are collaborating with him in our studies. And he's generated a mouse ipilimumab equivalent. Uh, one of these ipilimumab molecules does a great job of blocking CTLA-4, uh, 
uh, and it's the red line. And the other does a great job of blocking CTLA-4, but it also gets rid of cells that overexpress CTLA-4. And interestingly, T regulatory cells, those inhibitory T cells, dramatically overexpress CTLA-4. And this form of antibody shown in the black line depletes them. And so the data shown in the graph at the lower right shows if we take the same two tumor model and we've got mice that get a radiation to the big tumor and then get immunotherapy only to the big tumor. If they don't get any other treatment, the big tumor continues to grow as shown in the purple line. If they get a potent antibody that's great at blocking CTLA-4, like the red line, that big tumor still continues to grow even though we've interfered with the CTLA-4's inhibitory function. But if we use the antibody that can deplete T regulatory cells, the black line, now that big tumor shrinks away. And more importantly, shown on the next slide, not only does that big tumor shrink away, but in the same experiment, when we look at the distant second tumor, in those same animals, the black line shows that that distant tumor that did not get any radiation, that did not get exposed to any of this anti-GD2 IL-2 immunocytokine, that distant tumor did go away as long as we depleted the T regulatory cells with the anti-CTLA-4. If we look at any other combination of those agents in these mice, that second tumor didn't go away. So based on this, we think very potent immunotherapeutic effect that we are reproducing in other tumor models in our laboratory system, but we have published specifically on this melanoma data. We're excited about moving this forward. So here's very preliminary data showing how we can reproduce this same effect in another tumor model. Here, instead of looking at the uh, B78 melanoma growing in a strain of mice called C57 black, now we're looking at a separate kind of neuroblastoma that also expresses GD2, but it grows in a separate strain of mice, AJ mice. And the graph at the left shows that the red line is how these neuroblastomas grow without any therapy. The green line shows that how these tumors are slowed a bit by radiation therapy alone, but they continue to grow. The brown line shows how intratumoral immunocytokine makes those tumors grow slower, but they still continue to grow. And the red line shows that the combination of the radiation and the intratumoral anti-GD2 antibody IL-2 makes those tumors shrink, and seven out of seven mice uh, become completely cancer-free with a cancer response. These are mice with a single neuroblastoma. The graph on the right shows what happens to that neuroblastoma that you irradiate and that you treat with the immunocytokine in a mouse that has only one tumor, the red line, re recapitulating what's shown in the graph at the left, or what happens to that tumor that you irradiate and inject with immunotherapy if that same mouse has a distant NXS2 neuroblastoma, the treated tumor continues to grow, consistent with the concomitant immune tolerance that we've shown for the B78 melanoma in a separate tumor model. So conceptually, here's what we think is going on in the data that I've shown so far. We think that uh, in trying to get an immune response against the cancer, at the upper left, we've got the innate immune cells that are recognizing the tumor with antibody. In the middle, we've got the adaptive immune response, the T cells that would use their T cell receptors to recognize the antigen. And then to the lower left, we've got these immunosuppressive elements. I focus largely on T regulatory cells. We also know that there are other cells in the tumor microenvironment that can suppress the immune response, uh, like immunosuppressive uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells or other macrophage elements. So we think that radiation therapy can be doing two things. First, it can make the tumor more sensitive to innate immune destruction, and it also can have an effect against the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment shown at the lower left. Next, we think that that would enable an antibody IL-2 immunocytokine 
in order to help innate immune cells mediate antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity against the tumor in order to cause some destruction of the tumor that's now more sensitive to this destruction because of the radiation therapy, enabling that tumor that is partially being destroyed by that innate immune response to fragment and still have coded onto it the monoclonal anti-tumor antibody, which will allow those antibody-coded tumor fragments to be picked up by the FC receptors of the antigen-presenting cells, as shown at the lower right. And those tumor fragments are then picked up by those antigen-presenting cells and processed to enable the peptides from that tumor to be able to be presented by the MHC, the HLA antigens of the antigen presenting cell, to turn on a cytotoxic T lymphocyte sensitization that activates those T cells that specifically have receptors that can recognize the tumor peptides that are present on the tumor cell, not necessarily the ones that are recognized by the anti-tumor monoclonal antibody, put those into the cleft of the MHC and turn on the T cells that can recognize them, but then they need to be expanded by the IL-2 that drives those activated cells to expand to be able to subsequently expand to a potent cytotoxic T lymphocyte response that can destroy a tumor, not only at the site that's irradiated, but at distant sites as well. So we're taking this concept and moving it forward clinically. Just Two weeks ago, we learned from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration that our first in human protocol to test this concept has been approved by the FDA for testing in melanoma patients, where we're going to be using a combination of local radiation therapy, intratumoral anti-GD2 uh, immunocytokine, together with anti-CTLA-4 and nivolumab for advanced melanoma. We're doing this study in adults with melanoma here at the University of Wisconsin, uh, and I'm working together with our clinical melanoma leader, Mark Albertini, and with our radiation immuno-oncology leader, Zach Morris. And as much as the work I've talked about today has focused on our use of anti-GD2 antibody to have this effect, these concepts should potentially translate to the use of any tumor-reactive monoclonal antibody and IL-2 to be able to have these concepts work for uh, other kinds of cancer. So the last concept that I want to briefly mention is I did show before how we can overcome this tolerance effect by giving low-dose radiation therapy to all tumor sites. The problem is when we take this concept clinically, patients with cancer can have metastatic disease at many sites, sites that you can see and sites that you can't see. And if you wanted to actually deliver low-dose radiation to all of those sites to block this tumor immunosuppressive microenvironment, you'd be giving total body radiation, which would be counterproductive because it would be immunosuppressive. So is there a way to get radiation therapy just to the cancer? And the answer is the concept of targeted molecular radiation therapy. Now in the setting of adult oncology, Radio-labeled anti-tumor antibodies have been used particularly in the setting of lymphoma to preferentially get radiation therapy specifically to tumors. In the setting of pediatric oncology, uh, I-131 131 has been used as the molecule MIBG to selectively get radiation therapy to uh, neuroblastoma. We're using this concept and based on preclinical data that I really don't have a chance to, to show, uh, we're using targeted molecular radiation therapy to try and overcome this immunosuppressive effect. Uh, we're able to do this in our mouse models where we've been able to show here in data from Zach Morris's lab where molecular targeted radiation therapy shown in black has no effect by itself, where checkpoint blockade with CTLA-4 blockade has no effect, but the combination of them has a potent effect in mice with this NXS2 neuroblastoma. So we're moving this into a clinical trial that has now opened uh, at the uh, combined site in the United Kingdom of Southampton in London, uh, led by our colleagues Julia Gray and Mark Gaze. Uh, this is going to be an international trial that will also open in Greifswald, Germany, led by our colleague Holger Lode who's done pioneering work 
showing how nivolumab can add uh, synergistically to anti-GD2 immunotherapy to get better ADCC. And together with my colleague, Ken DeSantis, who's our uh, division head and our MIBG leader here in Madison, to use this together with our anti-GD2 immunotherapy. Uh, so this trial, so-called the minivan trial, is going to take these patients with high-risk relapsed neuroblastoma and treat them with radioactive MIBG to get targeted radiotherapy to them, to use anti-GD2 monoclonal antibody, and to combine this with checkpoint blockade in the form of nivolumab. Uh, so it's open in London and should be open soon in Madison and in Greifswald. So uh, that's the science I wanted to present. Uh, we have many, many collaborators that are working on this approach. I've tried to mention many of the collaborators at our UW Cancer Center in the upper left. I mentioned the collaborators in this international neuroblastoma trial at the lower left. We've got collaborators working through the Children's Oncology Group at St. Jude. Uh, our industrial collaborators include uh, Steve Gillies, who worked with Ralph Reisfeld to make these anti-GD2 molecules. Uh, BMS providing checkpoint blockade, and Apiron and USA uh, to be providing uh, the forms of the anti-GD2 uh, reagents or the checkpoint blockade. Uh, so in order to do this work, of course, we need grant support, and we've got the good fortune of having support from a variety of funding agencies enabling us to do the basic, the preclinical translation and the clinical trials. And uh, my last slide, just shows patients that have all been treated here at our Center for Pediatric Cancers here at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, every five years, we have a reunion of these patients. We have a mailing list of uh, approaching 1,500 such patients who've been cured of their pediatric cancers. And these patients have been cured over the last 25 to 30 years, largely using therapies that were being pioneered as preclinical work in the 70s and 80s, largely chemotherapy. But over the past 20 years, immunotherapy is clearly having a potent effect in the setting of both pediatric and adult cancers. We believe with less toxic effects, with less long-term genotoxic damage, and hopefully with better results and fewer long-term side effects. So we are hoping that the future is going to look bright by applying the immunotherapeutic principles in combination therapies that can activate both innate and adaptive immune responses. So thanks very much. I'll end it there and open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Sondo, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the send button. Our speakers will follow up with your questions via email. Now let's get started. Our first question is, is this approach only directed towards neuroblastoma and melanoma? So many people ask this after I've presented the data because much of our uh, clinical application has focused initially on neuroblastoma. The anti-GD2 antibody approaches we're working with have largely been directed against both neuroblastoma and melanoma. But many other cancers, including both pediatric and adult sarcomas, such as osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, can express GD2. In addition, some lung cancers express GD2. So provided that patients express GD2 on their cancers, the approach that we've been working with using anti-GD2 monoclonal antibodies should be applicable. But as I mentioned, most patients with cancer have cancers that express molecules that are recognized by separate monoclonal antibodies that have either been already approved for clinical use, such as uh, anti-CD20 or anti-EGFR or anti-EPCAM, uh, or anti-HER2, or have cancers for which monoclonal antibodies are currently in clinical testing and are likely soon to be approved for standard use. Uh, 
such that in the future, virtually all cancers should be recognizable by clinically available monoclonal antibodies. And the kind of approaches that we've been working on preclinically, we think would help those monoclonal antibodies to be used in combination with regimens that would activate innate immune recognition, ADCC, in a way that could be coupled with subsequent adaptive immune recognition to get the kind of memory responses we're hoping to turn on. And what antigens might this in situ vaccine approach be utilizing? So this is an important question that we're studying. In data that I was not able to show, when we turn on memory responses in mice that have gotten this combined adaptive innate immune combination therapy, and where we've used an anti-GD2 antibody to turn on that memory response, we show the mice that are cured can reject other melanomas that don't have GD2 on them. So even though the antibody that's used to recognize the tumor initially and turn on the initial innate response seems to be key in this response, the antigens that are recognized by the adaptive response by the T cells are not the same ones that are recognized by the antibody. And they can be a variety of molecules we're just in the process of studying. Our hypothesis is that two kinds of tumor-related antigens might be very important. One would be those neoantigens that are controlled by some of the mutations that are inherent in virtually any cancer. Some cancers, like lung cancers and melanoma, have many of those neoantigens because they have a high tumor mutation burden. Other cancers, like neuroblastoma, have a very low neoantigen load because of low tumor mutation burden, but their neoantigens might still be targets. But those don't have to be the only targets. We know from past immunotherapy work, such as the pioneering work of uh, Steve Rosenberg at the NCI or of Thierry Boone in Europe, that some of the most potent antigens recognized on human cancers aren't antigens controlled by mutated genes, but are antigens that are controlled by molecules that are expressed only on stem cells or on cancer testis uh, molecules, molecules that are not expressed by normal cells for the most part, but only cells early in their differentiation, but are highly overexpressed by cancer cells, molecules like MART or MAGE or other similar kinds of molecules. Okay, and looks like we're gonna have time for one more question. Uh, what other agents might combine well with this immunotherapy approach? We're studying that, uh, and we think that many other agents might combine, and we've got some preliminary data in mice that suggests that this kind of approach might be uh, uh, applicable for using not only antibodies linked to IL-2 as fusion proteins, but for anti-tumor antibodies and IL-2 as separate molecules. In addition, we've got some data saying that approaches that can activate better function of antigen-presenting cells can help turn on a better immune response. Molecules like anti-CD40, uh, these could be able to work. In addition, uh, there may be some benefit of using selective chemotherapy that might actually not cause suppression of the uh, immune system, but help augment antigen presentation and uh, suppress the tumor microenvironment. And finally, as I mentioned, we're really eager to be con uh, combining this with targeted molecular radiotherapy. All right, well, I would like to once again thank Dr. Sondell for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January of 2019. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.